Welcome back to the Packet Lab. Today's lesson is going to be a continuation in the Frame Relay series. Today we're going to take a break from theory lectures and take a look at some configuration. We're going to take a look at a basic Frame Relay configuration, and in this case we're going to look at a point-to-point -point connection. All right, like I said, we still have quite a few lessons left to fully cover Frame Relay, but I don't like to have a lot of theory lessons without breaking it up with a little bit of CLI, because in the end, that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be configuring Cisco devices. So even though it's possible that you may not understand everything that's in this lesson and we're not going to go too deep so I don't think that's going to be a big problem. It's still nice to get a look at the CLI and see some of the basic frame relay configuration in action. That said, today's lesson is going to be about frame relay point-to-point -point configurations. Now when you think of point-to-point, -point, probably the first thing that pops into your head is going to be PPP, which is a point-to-point -point protocol, or even possibly HDSL, which is the default encapsulation that a Cisco serial interface has, and that's, that's used in point-to-point -point connections. But for at least one reason, frame relay is a good choice when you're configuring point-to-point -point connections, and that reason is it's pretty likely that it's going to be a lot cheaper to purchase a frame relay virtual circuit than it's going to be to pay for a dedicated point-to-point -point lease line, especially when the geographical distance between the two endpoints increases. So if you have a connection from, you know, to use my favorite examples, Los Angeles to San Diego, you might be able to get a fairly reasonable price for a dedicated point-to-point -point connection. But if you're talking Los Angeles to New York, probably going to be best served to purchase a frame relay virtual circuit instead of a dedicated point-to-point -point leased line. Now, without getting off topic too much, PPP does offer some advanced features such as security and compression that aren't really available in frame really when you're configuring point-to-point -point connections. But, and this is another future lesson, you can run something called PPPOFR, which is point-to-point -point protocol over frame relay, in which case you can tap into those advanced features of PPP and provide such options as security. But that's another lesson. So with today's lesson, we're just going to concentrate on a simple point-to-point -point frame relay connection between two routers across the frame relay cloud, obviously, using physical serial interfaces. Okay, and the steps for configuring a point-to-point -point connection are going to be similar to almost all frame relay configurations. The first thing you're going to want to do is set the interface encapsulation to frame relay. By default, Cisco devices use HDLC encapsulation. So if you were to do a show interfaces on a serial interface that has not been encapsulated for frame relay, you will see that the encapsulation is HDLC by default. Okay, when I'm changing an interface encapsulation, I personally like to shut down the interface. Uh, especially when I'm doing this with frame relay, there's a feature called frame relay inverse ARP, and you'll hear me say this a lot in this lesson. We will look at that in much greater detail in a future lesson, but that's one of the things that you're going to want to avoid is having frame relay inverse ARP kick in, and a good way to stop that is to simply shut down the interface. Plus, if you're changing encapsulation, it's not like you're going to do that seamlessly. It's not like you're going to jump on in the middle of a production day, change from frame relay to PPP or, you know, the opposite way, whatever without dropping traffic. Your traffic isn't going to flow over this interface until you've completed your configuration generally on both sides of the link. So really there's no good reason not to have the interface shut down when you're making these kind of configurations. Okay, and that said, we shut down the interface and then the command to switch the interface encapsulation to frame relay is simply encapsulation frame relay. Okay, and as soon as you change the encapsulation to frame relay, and this even kicks in if the interface is down. As you can see here, it's still administratively down. We have it shut down. If you do a show interfaces and then specify the serial interface, you will see now that the encapsulation, instead of being HDLC, is frame relay. You'll also see some added information in here. If this is set for HDLC or PPP or something like that, you're not going to see LMI. And if you remember back to our initial lesson, which was the introduction lesson, LMI stands for Local Management Interface which is kind of a confusing phrase, but it's the communication between your device, the DTE device, and then the frame relay switch, which is the DCE device. And these provide keep alives. They also give you the PVC status. So they're really important for frame relay. They're not running right now because we do have this in shutdown. You'll also see sometimes some other stuff like this is for frame relay switch virtual circuits. We won't cover virtual switch virtual circuits because really they're not of any use anymore. They 
never got popular but anyways um, LAPF is also some encapsulation that goes around with frame relay but you might see that um, but you definitely will see this LMI and you will see the encapsulation change so this is actually a good verification command afterwards to make sure that your encapsulation did take so nine times out of ten especially in a pure Cisco environment that's it that's what you're, all you're gonna have to do for to turn on frame relay is just set the encapsulation to frame relay uh, depending on your circumstances you might have to do a couple of additional configuration options to get this running the first one would be to set your LMI type to match that to the frame relay switch now you do have to do this the LMI type on your interface does have to match that of the frame relay switch and if you remember back to the first lesson there are three different types Cisco, which is not Cisco proprietary, that's that gang of four standard. This is one of the few cases where when you see Cisco, it's not Cisco proprietary. Uh, there's ANSI and then there's Q933A. These are Annex A and Annex D. By default, Cisco devices will, of course, run Cisco. But you don't run into this so much because Cisco has a feature that's enabled by default, which is LMI AutoSense. So what it's basically going to do is it's going to send out one of each of these different types of LMI. It's going to send a request for these and the frame relay switch is going to be over here and it's only going to be able to respond to the one that it speaks. So, you know, this is French, English, and uh, German. If this box only speaks German, it's only going to respond to the request for German and it will go ahead and once the Cisco device receives the response, it'll say, oh, I know that this box speaks, you know, Q9393A, which is German in my shitty analogy. Anyways, this is pretty much going to handle it for you. You're not going to have to usually worry about this. If it is the case that you're having problems with your frame relay coming up, this might be a good place to start your troubleshooting. Just ask your service provider and say, what type of LMI are you running? And then you can go ahead and hard set this if you need to. Okay, so LMI is the communication between your DTE and the DC, which is a frame relay switch. So it's from your router basically to the cloud. Now, frame relay type is the communication from your router to the router on the other end. So it's the end-to-end -end communication. Again, the type has to match. By default, Cisco devices are going to use frame relay Cisco encapsulation, which is proprietary. So this is a case where if you have a Cisco router on one side of the frame relay cloud communicating to a God forbid, Juniper router on the other side of the cloud, and that Juniper router is most likely not going to support the Cisco frame relay encapsulation type. You're going to have to go ahead and set this to the industry standard IETF. So you can do that with the command that we use to encapsulate frame relay. If you go ahead and type in your question mark to invoke your Cisco IOS help, you will see that IETF is an option there. So you would type in encapsulation frame relay IETF. And again, as we learn in a future lesson, you can change this actually on a Delsi by Delsi basis, which is pretty cool. So if you have a Cisco router in this location, then you have a Juniper router and another Cisco router. You don't have to set the encapsulation to one standard. You can actually do this on a virtual circuit by virtual circuit basis. Okay, this next step is technically optional, but for today's lesson, we are going to make this mandatory. We're going to disable frame relay inverse ARP. Not going to go into this into a whole lot of detail because there will be, again, a future lesson that will go through this inside and out. You'll be sick to death of frame relay inverse ARP. Basically, it provides a dynamic mapping of layer 3 addresses to the layer 2 address, which is going to be a Delsi in this case. We don't want to do that. We're going to actually do a manual mapping, which is going to probably be the most difficult concept to get your head around in this basic frame relay configuration. So for now, let's just go ahead and disable it. We'll talk about why we disabled it later. No frame relay inverse ARP. So then the next step is to add a layer 3 address to the interface. We're going to be rocking the internet protocol today, so your IP address, and you should know how to do this already. Now the quote unquote difficult part. You have to map the remote layer 3 address to the local layer 2 address, which is going to be your Delsi. This is probably the most foreign concept when it comes to configuring frame relay. You're going to want to go through this mantra over and over again, remote IP address to local Delsi. Uh, a lot of people screw that up where they'll mix those up or they'll map the uh, remote layer 3 address to the remote Delsi, which seems to make sense, but in this case, it's not going to work. So the reason that we have to do this is because Frame Relay does not have a true address resolution protocol, and if you studied Ethernet, you know that ARP takes a layer 2 address, in that case, the uh, MAC address, 
and maps it to a layer 3 address, which most of the time we're going to be talking about IP, which is what we're going to be using today. And we just disabled the pseudo ARP feature of Relay Inverse ARP in the last step, well, the step before we configure the IP address. So we need to manually map the layer 3 IP address to the layer 2 del C. And again, as long as you remember remote layer 3 address to local layer 2 address, you're going to be fine with this. Just think of it as telling the, the uh, router to send all frame relay traffic destined for this remote IP address out this local del C. And again, there will be a dedicated lesson to mapping because it can get a little bit complicated, but once you get over that first bit of just knowing remote layer 3 to local layer 2, you're going to be good most of the time. So here's what the statement will look like on our router. It's going to be frame relay map, that's frame relay map statement, IP, we're going to be using the IP protocol, and then the remote IP address, the local del C, and then broadcast. Broadcast is going to be the subject of yet another lesson. There's not a true broadcast address in frame relay, like the all Fs address in Ethernet, so there's a pseudo broadcast. Uh, actually, broadcasts are sent out as unicast. Again, get into that a whole lot more detail in the future. All right, and then this slide just pretty much dissects the frame relay mapping statement. Uh, again, frame relay map is the command. Then you have to specify a layer 3 protocol. This could be IPX if you want, but we're going to be using IP. Then the remote layer 3 address, since we're using IP, it makes sense to have an IP address. This will be the IP address of the far end router, the router on the other side of our virtual connection through the frame relay cloud. This is a local Delsi number, which in this case is going to be 102. And then we're going to go ahead and allow pseudo broadcast support on this virtual circuit. All right, and then that's it. The nice part about doing a point to point connection is that you can take your configuration from one side of the virtual circuit and basically paste it onto the other side with just a couple of changes. Of course, you want your IP address on the interface to be different. In this case, it's going to be the .2 address. And then go down and tweak the frame relay map so that you're pointing to the remote IP address, which in this case on router 2 will be router 1's IP address with the dot one, and then use the local Delsi number, which in this case on router two will be 201, will get you to router one. And then once you have both sides configured, just go ahead and no shut the interfaces, bring them up, and let that frame relay magic start rocking. You're probably sick of me saying this, but these verification commands will be covered in more detail in another lesson. But kind of know these guys, play around with them. Uh, show frame relay LMI is going to show you LMI statistics and you'll get a lot of this with the show interface command as you saw we had some LM LMI statistics that show up as soon as you change that encapsulation type to frame relay. This is a big one. This will show you what the local delsies are. Now local delsies which is important for your frame relay maps. So it'll show you what the frame relay switch is advertising to you via LMI. So this is kind of an order. You want to check LMI first, make sure that that's up and good, and then go ahead and see what you're getting from the uh, frame relay switch in the form of PVCs, which are going to be DLC numbers. And then finally, you're going to want to verify your mappings. This is where a lot of the trouble starts because the mapping command sometimes gets screwed up. You might make the mistake that I wish I could say that I hadn't made tons of times and mapped the wrong address to the wrong DLC. But you'll be able to see this here and you know a lot of this will become a whole lot clearer once we finally get our asses over to the CLI which is what we're about to do here. I don't think I'm going to have a dedicated lab lesson for this because this really is one big lab lesson. So it's going to be combo platter here where we're going to go directly from here to the CLI. I've got Dynamips set up. What we're going to be looking at as our topology is we're going to have R1 over here. I mean this is going to be very simple. It's going to have the address of 10.1.123.1 slash 24. And then we're going to have our frame relay cloud. The local DLC for R1 is going to be DLC 102. And then on the far side, the local DLC will be 201. So to send traffic to R2, we're going to make a map saying, remember, it's always remote IP address to local DLC. We're going to say frame map IP because that's what we're using. Then we're going to use 10.1.123.2. And then we're going to say use del C 102 and we're going to include pseudo broadcast and then the same thing on the other side and if all goes well we should be able to ping each other from either side <laughs> okay and that said here is our GNS3 setup so we got R1 R2 and then we have a frame relay switch in the middle we're just using a single switch to emulate the cloud it's kind of instructive to take a look at this so if you right click on this and do show conf do a configure it'll show you how this is configured you have to select FR1 and you can see here we only have just two del C's so basically what this is saying is on port 1 of the frame relay switch, we're going to assign DLC 101. On the other side of that, which is port 2, if I double click this, it'll show up here, uh, we're going to have 201. So basically anything that gets sent in 
port 1 on Del C101 is going to be sent out port 2 on Del C201 and vice versa. So this is your R1 side and this is your R2 side. And that should be sufficient. Let's get on the CLI.